Next from the state capitol, we get reaction to the governor's State of the State address from the House and Senate minority leaders, Republicans Jim Durkin and Christine Rodonio. This runs about 14 minutes. Uh, I'll just say it's really refreshing to be here after uh, 12 years having a Republican addressing the General Assembly at the State of the State address, and in two weeks we will be back for the budget address. So uh, it was an absolute pleasure, but uh, Governor Rauner uh, was very bold, made very direct statements, but the type of statements that he ran on. That's what the people of Illinois want to hear, uh, of how we're going to get out of this death spiral. It's going to take a long time. We did not get here overnight, uh, but this is about a long-term plan to transform this building and also the state of Illinois. And I think many of the concepts that he talked about today um, indeed will generate a lot of discussion, but after one party rule for 13 years, a lot of concepts that were discussed today have not been talked about in this state, and yet other states around us have moved forward with various changes. So the bottom line here, and I think the governor made this point, is that Illinois is not competitive. So no matter what we have in place right now, as long as we're not competitive, the problem isn't solved and nothing can be taken off the table. We start with unemployment. It's at 6.3 percent. But if you look into and you dial into how many people have left the labor force and other ones who are underemployed, it's up to 12.5 to 13 percent. And that is right there the root problem that we have in the state of Illinois. So we look at what the governor stated today. We look at it in the big picture of how we're going to put people back to work. And I've heard that time and time again. And I know the speaker just made comments about we have to make Illinois more, more competitive put more people back to work. So um, I was very pleased with it, but we have to start with that principle of what the unemployment really is in Illinois. Well, the run-up to this, the years, has been a theme of, uh, I don't want to say anti-state worker, but it's been almost <coughs> anti-state worker. And if I'm uh, you know, a prison guard or something, looking at the news the last few days, it's like, wow, this governor really uh, has it out for me. And uh, how do you think that is going to resonate with uh, the legislature with people of Illinois? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I think some of these concepts will be controversial, but the fact of the matter is other states have made changes in those kinds of collective bargaining agreements, and it has made a difference for them. So how it eventually turns out, what kinds of things actually change, we will have a robust discussion about that, no question about it. But to take it off the table from the get-go, we will not be able to solve the problems in this state unless we all agree to do some things differently. There's nothing about saying be an anti-state employee when you say that we're going to reward people for production and for doing good work, and that's what he mentioned on the floor. Uh, I think that that is open for debate. I think it's something that we should discuss. And taking away uh, their ability to Republican employee unions to donate to political campaigns, thoughts on that? Well, he actually had a broader program than that. He talked about um, recipients of significant state dollars as well. Again, I think it's something that needs to be looked at. As he pointed out in the speech, other states have done this. You know, we have been in a little bit of a vacuum for a while because we haven't had a good two-sided discussion on a lot of issues that other states have had because we've had only one party at the table. So whether or not ultimately those things change or they're limited in any fashion, I don't think we can predict, but I think we can predict that we'll have a thorough airing of those issues. You know, the election's over and, you know, there's winners and losers. And I, I think people who are going to walk out of the, after today's discussion saying they're not happy with the governor, what he has said, the fact is he's open. And I think this is why you need to engage with the governor and his administration, particularly the public employee unions. And uh, uh, this is a man who, in, in his career, has been able to do that. He's worked with people. He's found resolutions to major problems. And I think that people need to look at it in that perspective. We've heard the governor talk about his plans as a whole and, he, you know, encouraging people to not break it up piecemeal right away. But you've been around long enough and you've worked with Democrats long enough. And you also see what's going on in Washington when things are presented as a whole package one thing would be a sticking point and then everything breaks down. Do you think it's a mistake for him to uh, start out, you know, from the gate saying, you know, look at it, it's all or nothing? I don't think he's saying all or nothing. I think he's saying recognize that the good is going to have to be taken with the bad. What's good for me may not be good for someone else or they may not view it as good, but we're both going to have to compromise. I think he stressed compromise. I'm looking forward to doing that but also, again, addressing some issues we haven't had a chance to do. I think everybody needs to just take a deep breath. Every single legislator has an interest in creating jobs, whether they're Republican or Democrat, 
downstate or suburban, they want jobs in the state and they want our financial condition stabilized. That's the end goal and that's what we need to keep our eye on. Do you see any compromise on this workers' cap, employment, uh, you know, constitutional amendments or what cap, uh, what was it, lawsuits, uh, lawsuit, so-called abuse, uh, reforms to prevent unreasonable trial or venue shopping? Can you see that stuff going through here? Well, you know what? Uh, it's a democratic legislation. I think the speaker just said he was keeping an open mind, which I think was I think great to hear. Said that he would be, yeah, and then we will do the same. And there's certain things that, based on past opinions, are, I mean, may be very difficult because of the constitutional issues that we run into. We have to change the constitution on some of these matters. But venue shopping, I think that we have that ability, and that's what part of the negotiation is. When you have a strong governor in Illinois, uh, it forces the issue and it forces the discussion. So. Um, I think that that's going to play out over the course of this, this session and maybe even next session. How but could you leverage righteous work zones, these empowerment zones that he's talking about? What kind of political can you do that with downstate Democrats? Is there a way to, to leverage this? How does it work? I think you'll see a lot of coalitions being built, as I mentioned earlier. Suburban Democrats um, have similar interests as suburban Republicans. Downstate Democrats, downstate Republicans have similar interests. So um, this is going to be about coalition building to move the state as a whole and particular geographic areas forward. You're optimistic these things can get through. I think there's a lot of hope and optimism. Obviously, we're all going to be tested significantly in the coming few months. But um, as you said, it's now or never. It's do or die for Illinois. I don't think the House Rules Committee is going to be as rigid as it has been over the past 12 years. So I think they'll be a little bit loosening at that uh, part of the committee process in the upcoming months. Do you have a deal with the speaker on that? I think that I've had discussions with the speaker and I heard his comments. And it seems to me that he is very much open to working with his administration to advance a number of the things which he discussed today. Uh, I mean, we don't have details, we don't have the minutia, but the thing is, this is part of the negotiation. But the fact is, the, go the speaker has stated that he wants to work with his governor on a lot of these issues, and I think that's very positive. We haven't had, again, today was historic. I have not sat and listened to a Republican uh, address the le legislature since uh, 2001. So a number of our members have never even heard a Republican speak uh, to him at a, at a budget address or a state of the state address or the budget address. So. Uh, it's a new day, and you know, let's just see how this plays out. But I think, all in all, it's been very positive. This governor is going out of his way to meet individually with members of the, with the House and the Senate, uh, and he's going to continue to do that. And I will tell you, my being down here for so many years, that personal touch is extremely important, and he, and, and it's sincere what he's trying to do. Talk to people, get to know them, they understand who he is, what his thoughts, and how we, we need to move this agenda in Springfield. But I think it's going to be uh, very positive how he's going about it, and it's something which uh, he's done more than most governors. See you, a path, you see a path to, go, to get to more funding for education, more funding for prison guards when you've got you know, these giant holes in the budget. And what path is that, and how many people are in? Well, obviously, every, I think there is agreement. Everyone would like to fund education better. Um, he has raised the issue of reviewing the tax code. I think that we will see him come up with innovative ideas and in delivering services that might free up additional money. So I think there is a path to it, and I think there is consensus, certainly, to fund education. Well, we're going to start with this fiscal year, for, and you know, we've got to address the hole we're in right now. And we'll get there. We'll, we'll make some, we're in the course of negotiating with the caucuses and how to try to reach some type of uh, uh, agreement how we can do that, but one step at a time. We'll hear the budget address in a few weeks, and, you know, I, I've, I'm cautioning our members not to get too far in front on any issue. We'll deal with them as they come in. But it's important that we focus on the most pressing issue of the moment we have in this building is the balance of this fiscal year. There's a lot of people scratching their heads, though, because the pension issue wasn't addressed. Uh, does that loom over all of this? Sure, but the thing is, this governor said that we would like to wait for the Supreme Court, who will probably return an opinion by end of April or May. There will be an argument at the end of March that you're going to work on an expedited basis, and uh, we're going to wait and see how that turns out. Money is being held. I'm not sure how much is being held based on the reforms from last year. But if it's my hope that the Supreme Court does uphold Senate Bill 1. Uh, other people think otherwise. But uh, I don't hope I, getting back and doing this over again will not be an easy ch task. It will be very difficult. Can you talk about, uh, irrespective of Cardi, a lot of people would say that we've had a, a 
missing, we haven't had a leader in the governor's mansion, and after the last 12 years, it's been government by the legislature, which is not really how the system is supposed to work. To what extent will having, if Governor Rauner is as much of a leader as he seems to be coming out and, and being engaged, more so than his predecessors, to what extent does that matter in the process of forming this consensus and getting deals done so that you get where you need to go? Well, I think it's huge. I mean, um, when you look at, um, take school funding, for instance, last time we did a major overhaul, um, it was a top priority of Governor Edgar. Um, so I think it takes leadership from the top to get everyone to the table. And the governor has the ability, because of the many tools he has, to encourage people to compromise and put votes on things. So I'm very encouraged by the strength at which he seems to be coming out. Let's say I'm a single mom. <laughs> no, I can't. No, 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 no. no. Somebody else has a question. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> you go out for like to get out, get to go home, you go to McDonald's, person waiting on you is a single mom making minimum wage. What assurance does that person have that the Republican Party in Illinois and this governor really get it, really understand uh, that person's problems and uh, is the right one to get them out? What, what assurance does anyone have? I mean, you know, everyone's situation is different and unique. Um, obviously, we want to help people succeed to the best of their potential, regardless of what their situation is. Um, I think this governor in particular is unique in that he has demonstrated his understanding of those in less fortunate in, uh, situations through his philanthropy, um, his wife's activity in early childhood ed education. So I think that he comes out of the box with some credibility in that area. Would you Well, I think he's going through, you know, the hand he's been dealt right now. So he may propose in the budget address to consolidate agencies. I think, again, we're talking about being open here to ideas that maybe we haven't looked at before. And if that's one of them, I would be open. Do you think that consolidation, you know, by his executive order might poison the well a little bit on budget compromises? I don't see how it would. Yeah. I mean, they're going to be looking at every area within this state government to find efficiencies and save money. So if it requires consolidation under his constitutional authority through executive order, then let him do it. Christine, you, you, Christine, you were working in social work. I mean, to the extent that now it, it seems that we're going to get a handle on spending. Medicaid spending is going to have to be targeted because that's where the dollar is going. What's your reaction to going after Medicaid dollars, and to what extent, how do you hold harmless those who actually are in great need of it? Well, you know, we did a Medicaid reform in the last few years that was a bipartisan compromise. Many of those reforms that we put in place were actually undone by the Democrats. Layered on top of that, ex eligibility was expanded. So I think we need to go back to that core principle of focusing on those who truly need it, ridding the system of fraud, both on the recipient side as well as the provider side, which we haven't really looked a lot at. So I think we have opportunities here um, to reign in government but still be compassionate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.